All right, so we've talked theory, we've talked data. Now let's just start to think about the actual algorithms that you might use. And what I mean by algorithm really is the actual statistical or machine learning or, you know, approach that is used kind of mathematically to actually associate the occurrence records with the environmental conditions, okay? I showed earlier on a kind of generic form that the, why the probability of a species occurring is some function of x1, which might be temperature, and uh, some function of x2, which might be precipitation, etc. But that's just a generic thing. You know, what actual form that takes is what we mean by the actual um, algorithm. So sticking with our kind of flow diagram of what we're, what we're going through here, um, this is where we're at. Yeah? What's the actual algorithm that we're going to use? And there are a ton of them, basically. As I'm sure a few smiles already, you, you, those of you who have started to dip into the literature will be acutely aware that there are many, many different ways that have been applied to, to do this. You know, species distribution modeling or ecological niche modeling with any number of different approaches. Um, and this is just a, 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 a set of, you know, a, a few examples, basically. This is in no way anything like exhaustive. I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. I've broken it down a little bit into what we might term the kind of method, which is more kind of, at its core, the, 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 the statistic or the, the, the actual algorithmic approach that's used to generate the model. Versus what we might term the kind of model or software name. Now that's kind of more what's, what you might see published in the literature. You know, I run a biomod or I run a GAR or I run a species model or, or something like that. That's more uh, a level that sometimes authors will give to their package to how they you know, actually have implemented this. But they, they might run, as I'll show you, you know, different types of actual algorithms within that model. So then broken it down into um, uh, data type. Uh, so is it presence only data? So some of the models can only function with certain types of data. So if you only have presence data, there are certain uh, algorithms that kind of you can't really use unless you start making some assumptions about what we might term kind of pseudo absences that, we're, that we'll talk about. So some of them, uh, very simplest approaches, climatic envelope um, or bioclin is one that I'll mention in a minute. Um, that only use present records. Then you have a, 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 a set of methods, things like ENFA, ecological niche factor analysis, or maximum entropy, that use present background data, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but this is important because, you know, the data sets that you have, if you have absence records, that, with all the caveats that we've already talked about, if you have absence records that you are um, uh, confident in, then there are certain methods that you're probably more likely to use. If you only have present data, then there are certain methods that you're more likely to use. So there's a very practical consideration here in terms of which methods can match your, your data set. Some of the methods, like GARP, is a method that uses what we might term kind of presence and pseudo-absence. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute, what we mean by that. And then there are a whole series of methods. These are often the more traditional kind of uh, regression-based approaches, um, but not not... Not always, so a lot of regression-based approaches, uh, boosted regression trees, artificial neural networks, different methods that require presences and absences. Okay, so they're methods that are designed to, in effect, have two groups, one group of presences, one group of absences. Of course, they're genetic meth uh, generic methods, so that those two groups might be any number of things, but they, they are designed to contrast and characterize two groups, whereas some of these other methods are just based on, in effect, one group, that being presence. Okay. So, within these, you know, Biotin is one that you will see um, published, and that basically implements a kind of climate envelope approach that I will talk about. MaxEnt is a model that has a software interface that's very user-friendly, very um, straightforward to use. You can also run that now through tools like Biomod that I'll mention in a minute, but that is a, a model that's often referred to, but the, the, the fundamental principle that's underlying it is one of maximum entropy, that's the kind of machine learning approach that's used to generate the model. GARP uses a genetic algorithm, but you'll see people refer to the, the, the GARP model, but it uses a genetic algorithm. Um, so they're the, the just trying to help you make sense, really, of what, what you kind of would, would see in the literature. 
But increasingly, these approaches are, are run in running R. It's really becoming the standard um, method for, for actually implementing a lot of these methods. So I encourage you to look at tools like Dismod is a, 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 a library within um, R for, for implementing these kinds of methods. Um, Biomod is a, a, a very cool um, approach as well um, that I'd encourage you to, to have a look at. So particularly some of the earlier methods, you know, implement um, an algorithm within what might be referred to as a model or, or a software package. But increasingly the field has evolved towards tools like R, um, where you can implement many different methods um, within one kind of pipeline within R. So for example, you can call Maxent within um, R, like Biomod or, or, or Dismod. Um, and then increasingly there are these packages such as Biomod, which don't just implement one algorithm or one method, but they actually implement lots of different methods. So within that framework that's referred to as Biomod, that uh, Wilfred Tullier and um, a colleague has, has, has put together and, and, and um, uh, made available, um, implements lots and lots of different algorithms. You can run um, gen uh, genetic algorithms, uh, regression pro uh, approaches like uh, generalized linear models, you can run Maxent, you can run artificial neural networks, you can run many, many different approaches. And then as I'll talk about in a minute, the idea is often to then try and look at a kind of a consistency across um, different methods. So, as I've emphasized, we're not talking about particular algorithms, but if you're looking to get started with approaches to use, then I think that Maxent is a good starting point because it's fairly straightforward to actually implement. The mathematics behind it is not straight, so straightforward, but it's, it's good and it, it's been shown to perform well compared to other methods. It's well thought out, it's robust. So that's a good starting point. If you do a web search, you will soon find loads and loads of publications and training materials. You can download the software, you can download the tutorial, you can download example data sets. Stephen Phillips is the key author there, Phillips et al. Okay, you soon get across it. Phillips, Maxent, um, the, the, the main site is out of Princeton, um, where you can download the data. Okay, so that would be a good starting point. The other good starting point I would point you towards is just generally working within R, but have a look at Biomod. Again, there are training materials. The key author is Wilfred Tullier, T-H-I, which <laughs> I know there are French folks here that will pronounce that properly, T-H-U-I-L-L-E-R. Um, uh, again, Wilfred's made uh, training materials available, um, so have a Google of that, have a play, and actually sit down with your data and crunch your data, and, 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 and you, know, you, can, you can do that. Um, Dismod is another one within R, which is kind of like Biomod, but will enable you to kind of do a pipeline of, of preparing your data and then running different algorithms. So I very much encourage you to you know sit down when you get back at the computer with your data and start with one of those three, or probably you want to have a look at all of those three, and uh, that will get you started pretty quickly. Who, who here has? kind of been through that process of starting with, hang on, I want to run one of these models and say downloading Maxent in the tutorial and got a result within a couple of hours. Yeah. Okay. So what do I kind of mean by this species data type? What, what am I really referring to there? It's just a way to kind of conceptualize it. And again, Looking at different algorithms, they use the data very differently. Remember when we, you know, we're not even talking about a class of all regression-based algorithms or something here. We're talking about a whole suite of very, very, very different approaches, machine learning approaches, regression approaches, more simple box-type models that, that, that I'll show you in a minute. So um, they treat data fundamentally um, differently. But here's one way of trying to kind of get your head around um, when you see rough references to like presence background or things, what, what that really means. So one way of course is that you just got presence data. All right, we've talked about presence data and some of the methods will just, just work with the presence data and I'll show you by a thing in a minute which, which does that. Other methods, as I say, just work with presence and absence data. So you have good absences, you're confident you're gonna use them, you can use any number of approaches that have this kind of two categories that they're trying to contrast. They're trying to group presences and they're trying to group absences. 
Another thing that you will see commonly in the literature is this idea of presence and pseudo-absence. Okay? Um, so on the previous slide, I think I only listed one approach as being um, kind of presence and pseudo-absence, because the GARP algorithm that uses a genetic algorithm explicitly takes this approach of, of, of pseudo-absences. But in, in practice, a lot of these methods that are actually presence-absence methods have been implemented <coughs> excuse me um, have been implemented in a presence pseudo absence way and what I mean by that is that you basically um, set or select a set of records from areas elsewhere in the landscape that you're kind of going to assume are absences and you're going to set that as your set of absences so it's pseudo absence in terms of um, we're just going to select some areas in the landscape where we don't have presences, and we're going to make the assumption, in effect, that they are absences. Okay? Which probably, in some ways, sounds a bit ropey, right? You, you, you're making some big assumptions. Um, but, in a kind of statistical sense, you're then, you're, you're really creating two sets. You're creating one set that you know are just presences, and you are creating another set that you... Um, expect to be presences and absences. You're not really, they're not pseudo absences that you know they're absences, but you're trying to contrast all presences that you know they're presences versus this other set of cells that you hope are more absences than presences, but might include presences, but still, um, you know, it's a kind of something to contrast your presences against. It's not an area that I understand terribly well and that I would necessarily recommend, um, but this is a method that you will see out in the literature. People are using presence-only methods or presence-absence methods with presence-only data by creating pseudo-absences where you're randomly selecting absences from, from, from the landscape. I say randomly selecting absences. Sometimes folks have not just randomly selected absences but have actually informed where those absences come from um, by doing some more clever things. So, for example, one thing that's been done is to do a kind of... Um, environmental analysis to, to sample the pseudo-absences from environments that are very dissimilar to where you've already got presences. Which I would argue is kind of going halfway towards doing a species or an ecological niche model. So I'm not going to go further with that, but I want to put out there that you know this, this is an approach that is used, and in effect it's, it's using presence-only data, but sampling and in effect, um, to put it crudely, making up what your absences are. And, using pseudo-absences. <coughs> Another method which is very, very similar, but widely used, but just conceptually or theoretically a little bit different, we refer to as presence background data. Okay? So this is a, another set of algorithms that work by um, trying to contrast the presence data, so the group of presences that you have, with the set of environments that are available for the species. Okay? That set of environments we'll, we'll usually refer to as, as background. So it's represented here, this is just an, I think this is um, temp a temperature layer or something, but what you're basically trying to do is contrast your presence localities with the environments that are available or the background that's available through the study area. Okay? So, Again, I'm trying to keep this quite generic because there are different methods that do it differently, but this is, this is a, a way of categorizing all the different methods. So, what's the difference between these two methods, right? So, in this method, what we might do is realistically sample, say, 10,000 records from the background to represent, you know, what environments are available. So, we have a set of presences and just a sample of, of the environments that are available. This is actually doing something very, very similar. We're also going to take our presence records and then we're going to sample from the rest of the study area and call those pseudo-absences. In practice, the two methods are very, very similar. In, um, again, in practice, what actually the difference is, is that within a presence background approach, where you have actually found the species, those presence localities, are also part of the background. <coughs> so you could have a, a locality where you have a presence record that also appears in your, your background data set, theoretically. 
because you're trying to contrast the presences with the environments that are available, that include presences and absences. This set of methods is you know, conceptually slightly different because you, you, you wouldn't sample your pseudo-absences from localities where your presences actually occur. But you'll see in practice they're, they're actually quite, quite similar because usually you've got a lot more background or pseudo-absences than you have actual presence records. But there's conceptually the way that they function is different. The whole conceptual thing behind an approach like Maxent is that you're contrasting your presences with the environments that are available. Whereas a kind of presence-absence approach that's implemented as a presence-pseudo-absence approach is where you're trying to contrast your presences with another set of points that are your absences that you're kind of estimating, your, your, your pseudo-absences. Again, conceptually, I'm trying to get across that, that, that general categorization of, of the different methods. And when you're choosing an algorithm, you need to bear those kinds of, of, of things in mind. You know, what data do you have? Are you comfortable using your absences? If not, then you know, do you really want to use a presence-only method, or do you want a presence background? These kinds of things. Here's another real key consideration that's 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 quite <coughs> crucial, I think, and it relates back to model complexity and what we will call overfitting. Now, overfitting, of course, is a very general statistical or, or, or modeling concern that we have, where you fit your model very well to the particular data set that you have, but it overfits to one data set and then isn't generalizable to another data set. So let, let me talk you, you, you through this, so hopefully that becomes clear. We've looked at maybe just one response curve um, so far. So remember the idea here was that we're just looking in one environmental dimension. So this might be temperature or precipitation or any number of, of, of dimensions of the niche that we're trying to characterize. And then this is our probability that the species will occur there. All right? Well, we had another example earlier where it's habitat suitability, but the, the principle is, 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 for our purposes, the same. So, as I said, what we might expect to see will be this kind of nice blue line. It might be something that's kind of ecologically realistic, that you have a high probability of the species occurring at some sort of mid-range of, of values, and then as you get further away from that set of values, the probability that the species occurs will, will tailor off. You know, it gets too hot or it gets too cold, it gets too dry, it gets too wet, whatever, right? An overfit model, so, so, so that might be the kind of response curve that we're trying to parameterize our model to give us. Remember when I talked earlier, we, we kind of cut one off and said, well, suppose we've only got half of it. What's going to happen in the other half? Remember when we talked about extrapolation? But this might be a sensible target. Now, if we overfit the model, we might draw a line that's some, uh, a response curve that looks something like that red squiggle there. Okay? Where, in actual fact, it would be very closely fitting to a few samples that we have, but it's not actually a realistic representation of what the model is, you know, or, or how the, the species is actually responding to the environment. And then a very underfit model might be the opposite, might be so simple that it just looks like a box, but we're, we're literally just saying, well, um, we're not dealing with probabilities at all here, but if you go above a certain value, then species won't occur, and if you go below a certain value, then the species um, won't occur as well. Okay? So this is trying to contrast um, what might be, might be biologically meaningful versus a model that is overfit versus one that is underfit. So take it to the next step, then. Look at it in two dimensions. What's that going to mean? when we actually try to build our model. Remember, in reality, we're often doing this in many dimensions. We might be doing it in 15, 20 dimensions, 15, 20 different variables. But let's just look at it in two variables. Again, so our, our, suppose our points here are our actual occurrence records. That's where we found the species, right? An overfit model would fit very closely around those localities, yeah? this kind of idea, but in, in more dimensions. Something that might be more biologically meaningful might be this blue line here that's fitting um, around all those points, but not quite so closely. And then something that's kind of underfit might be just this kind of box that's saying, well, you know, between two points, um, we're saying that the species can occur, or between two other points on a, 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 another ecological dimension, we're saying the species can occur. Okay? 
Okay? And we'll come back to this because this is, this is particularly relevant when we talk either later today or tomorrow morning about how to um, evaluate the models. Because what we're trying to do is avoid overfitting. Because when you start throwing at this um, test points, you want to say, well, let's go out and sample some more points. And we find that the species, say, occurs here. And your overfit model is not going to perform very well. And your more sensible model might be doing a better job. Okay? But that's when we talk about overfitting. That's, that's what we mean. And geographically, of course, we can then come from environmental space into geographic space. And this, if we, you know, if we then think about it geographically, of course, it's just conceptual again, but you'll see we've got exactly the same idea of, of fitting very closely around our points. And, and that's what we're trying to do with these models. Parameterize them such that they're not overfitting to our points, but they're not underfitting so that we don't really have a sensible prediction. But as with a number of things we're talking about, we can do statistics and that to try and optimize that, but there's, there's some gray area there of just how much you're trying to fit to your points and, and, and how generalizable the model is, is, is going to be. That makes sense? So I'm just going to give you two examples of, of algorithms that are out here. And this is probably the, 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 the very simplest approach um, that was published. Um, so a good reference there of a kind of review of this approach from last year. Um, but this is going back to the 80s, some really cool work done in Australia um, using this very simple conceptual approach. But I want to start with that because it's a good illustration of, of, of one of the methods. And actually, I would argue it's still much more applicable than we think now. Often we think it's so simple, published in the 80s, you know, it's, it, we can do better than that now. Well, not, that's not, not necessarily the case. So what, what we do here, again, we've got our two um, environmental variables. We've got our occurrence records. All we're basically going to do is start um, drawing boxes around those points. We're basically just going to say what the limits are here in terms of um, minimum and maximum and minimum and maximum um, uh, uh, values in environmental space that that species can occur in. Now, in, in practice, I'm simplifying it a bit because this will work with percentages. So you will say how 100% of the, of the records are included, 90%, 80%, 70%, 60% of, of the number of records that you're including. But generally, conceptually, it's a presence-only method. It doesn't care what else is going on in terms of background, pseudo-absences, absences, it's just taking your present points and saying, well, what, what are the set of conditions that those species, you know, those records come from? What's the minimum temperature we found the species? What's the maximum temperature? What's the minimum rainfall? What's the maximum rainfall? What's the minimum pH for soil? What's the maximum pH, right? That is a distribution model. That is a very simple just characterization in a very simple way of you know, trying to characterize this is my estimate of the niche of the species. We can do all sorts of fancy, funky, different ways of estimating probabilities that use complex um, machine learning approaches and that. But ultimately, um, you know, this is still an ecological niche model. It only requires presences. It's simple and intuitive. It's very transparent. You know exactly what's going on there. Uh, some of the limitations, for example, would be it gives equal weight to all the variables. So if you have like correlated variables, well, it, it's, just, it's just including them all. Um, some of the more advanced methods will enable you to weight or will automatically weight some variables more than others. Um, it doesn't account for interactions between variables as well, um, whereas some of the more advanced methods will allow you to actually look at you know, interactions between variables so that you're looking not only... You know, your niche is not just a, a box that's saying if it's cold up, if, you know, if it gets too cold or if it gets too hot, but it's saying, well, um, it, might be, it might be too cold if, um, if there's not much rainfall, but if there's a lot of rainfall, then it's not too cold. These kinds of things are so interactions between different variables that Biocon can't take into account, but, but some of the more advanced methods um, can. So also, there isn't really a way with this to use categorical variables. So some of you may be working with, I've given the example of soil types or land cover types, where you, you don't have a continuous variable, but you actually have categories. You might have 10 different soil types or five different land cover types or something like that. And this approach doesn't really have a way, if you want to incorporate that information, 
of, of, of using it li within the method. But still, conceptually, it's a very simple and straightforward way. So if I, if I go back a slide, um, you know, it's, it's, it's in effect this kind of um, prediction, right? It's going to give you this kind of, in effect, box in environmental space, all right? But it's cool. Now, some of the more, more advanced methods that we're going to talk about um, and that you're going to play with, if you're running Maxent, if you're running Biomod, where you can run boosted regression trees and oh, multi-adaptive um, regressions, variant regression splines and things, Mars, um, uh, di different methods, they can fit extremely complex response curves. All right? So um, in Maxent, you can get response curves that look like this. They're all over the place, and they're overfit. So they're incredibly powerful methods, but we have to use them very carefully because it's very easy to overfit. And we think we've got wonderful models because they fit to the data sets that we have, but we've got these points and we fit really well to them because we build a really complex model that characterizes the environmental space in a really complex way. But we have to ask, have we overfit? Have we gone too far? Have we fit so closely to those points that when we ask it to generalize, say make a prediction in another area or for a different set of points or a different time slice, that we don't actually have much predictive performance there. Okay. So that's a big caveat when you're thinking about running methods like Maxent, that they're very powerful and they're very cool, but you have to treat them with, with care and effect. Um, just one slide then on, on, on Maxent. As I say, um, go download the information. Philips et al. 2006 is your starting point for trying to get into the mathematics behind this um, that you, know, you, should, you should read and, and understand if, you, if, if you're going to apply the methods. But in effect, this really is a truly a, 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 a presence background type approach. So you only require presence data, but the, the fundamental way that it works is to say, again, look, th this is like, you know, these aren't really response curves now, but suppose this is our environmental condition, and this was the frequency of occurrence of, of, of records um, at that environmental condition. We might find that we frequently get our species occurring at a particular value, and we don't ever get it you know, below or above certain values. So this is kind of like our response curve, but we can do the same for the, for the actual study region. So we can ask, within our study region say Madagascar or whatever, what are the actual environments that are available for the species? All right, and that's what, when we talk about background, that's what our background is, this kind of light gray here. It's what environments are available for the species. So, so it's a very powerful machine learning method based on the pr principle of maximum entropy that is, is in effect trying to contrast where you find the species against the environments that are available for it. It's very cool because it doesn't give weight, equal weight to all the variables. It, 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 the way it functions, it's a machine learning approach. It can actually, in effect, think for itself that you know the particular variable is clearly more important than others, so it will upweight and downweight different variables based on the variables that it's getting most information from. It can account for potential interactions between species. Um, so as I say, if you, you know, species that that um, doesn't. It may only occur if it, in a very cold environment if it's also very wet. The model will pick up that kind of level of, of complexity. You can use categorical variables. The, the, the algorithms are, are implemented such that you could feed in um, a variable that has categories and it will make sense um, within, within the software, within, within the approach of, of those data. And you can ultimately build really, really complex um, response curves. All right, so there are all these different methods out there. That's what I've essentially emphasized so far. So which, which one are you going to choose? Well, first of all, does it matter? Does it really matter which one you choose? We thought about this a while ago. Um, so a couple of papers that were published in 2004, 2005, 2006, that, that kind of area where... There's been a lot of work where um, people are using different algorithms to do different things, and we um, organised a workshop, uh, essentially funded by Conservation International, who are being very interested in these methods, to, to bring together people who are kind of experts on their own 
model that they were working with. Um, I was at the time playing with artificial neural networks, seeing how well they could perform. And um, this idea of a CER as a climate envelope range is very much like a biochem model that I've just shown you. And then there are um, other methods in there that I'll talk you through. But what we did was basically say, let's sit down with an identical data set and run all our different methods and just you know, show that we get the same result. It doesn't really matter, does it, whether you use an artificial neural network or biochem or, or whatever. You know, the, the principles are the same. This is kind of worst case scenario, okay, so, so don't think that it's always as bad as this, but this is a good, a good example. So here's two species. We're interested in climate change. Um, um, so what we were doing was predicting the species, those two species, under um, a future climate scenario. So we build a model for the present day and then we project it for a different time slice. Um, and then we basically asked, well, what's the range gain or range loss into the future? Okay, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but um, essentially, you know, you build the model for the present day, say, well, habitat suitable here, and then you predict that in the future it's suitable over here. So what, you know, is, is have we lost habitat, have we gained habitat? Um, and that was the kind of measure that, that, we were, um, that we were interested in. And for good reason, because there's a lot of work being done um, estimating extinction risk for species based on these kinds of estimates, you know. Um, if, if your habitat is predicted to massively shrink in the future, then, then you would often infer that, that that would be a species at high risk of extinction. And we did that two ways. Um, we, we projected into the future and then we asked, well, what's the range gain or loss if you assume that the species can disperse? So remember our, our BAM diagram, where we had movement as one of the key things. We assumed that movement wasn't a problem and that a species can move wherever it wants in the landscape. And we then did another test where we basically said, Let, let's assume that species can't move at all, and uh, two extremes. So for each species, uh, let's just look at you know, one, one set of bars. This is basically saying that for this species, we, had, we predicted a massive range expansion for the species. There was a massive range gain um, by this model. That's assuming that the species can disperse. If you assume that it can't disperse, then we have a bit of a range loss. Now that, okay, that, that, that difference is kind of okay because that's based on the assumption of we don't understand how good the dispersal capacity is so we'll just take the two extremes. So you'd expect to see a big difference and of course with the stripy ones that are the range um, assuming uh, no dispersal you can never get a range gain, your, your, your range can never expand in the future because you can never expand beyond your, your, your present range. It's not necessarily a great way of actually asking questions about climate change but it was a way for us to look at how the models were performing. Okay. So of course the key thing here that you immediately see is that suppose you um, uh, assume you know, that species can disperse, um, you get anything from with one model, this is a generalized linear model, so of course these are just different models, sets of bars for different models, we predicted a massive range gain. For a different model, genetic algorithm, we predicted a range contraction. Very, very different <laughs> results from um, different methods. As I say, this is kind of an extreme version um, of this. Um, this is kind of a worst case species. Um, we could trace this back in terms of where the problem is coming from. Um, the, the main issue is, is this idea of extrapolation. So this, these were species in South Africa, was our case study. When you do some extra analyses that ask, based on the occurrence records that we have today, and the environments that we're projecting into, most of those environments that we're projecting into are, there, there's no present day proxy. So we're extrapolating, remember we talked earlier about extrapolating, way beyond the range of what the models were calibrated for. Okay. And when you're extrapolating beyond the range, the models are doing completely different things. So in those areas where, say the model is calibrated up to random number 15 degrees C, and then we're asking, well, what happens at 25 degrees C? Some of the models are massively, you know, just continuing the trend in one direction. Others are being much more cautious and, 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 and assuming that the probabilities decrease. But basically, the models are all doing completely different things, and it results in very, very different outputs. So I'm emphasizing again, it's kind of worst case scenario, and it's particularly relevant under climate change applications because of this issue of extrapolation into unknown climates that we talked about earlier. 
but that was kind of alarming, right? So, bottom line for us at, at immediately is your choice of algorithm can really matter. We've done other studies where it shows that it doesn't matter anything like as much, but the choice that you make can be very important. Okay. So one approach that's um, being used to try and kind of um, deal with this is, is, is what's often termed as an ensemble or consensus approach. I mentioned earlier the, the kind of parallel with, with the different um, general circulation models, the atmospheric oceanic general circulation models that we use to predict um, uh, past and future climates. I say we, that's the grand we as science, have no idea how to run one of those models myself. But um, uh, there are different methods and they produce different outputs. So what the climate community have been doing for years is using ensemble or consensus approaches, and this is you know, fundamental to what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does, they look at what, what's consistent, what kind of projections are consistent across different models. So in our field, particularly Miguel Rougeau, who's, who's been driving um, uh, the, the, this forward, uh, came up, and this is from a paper that, that, that he, he co-authored uh, a few years ago now, said, well, we should be doing a similar thing in, um, in distribution modeling or in ecological niche modeling. We should be taking outputs from lots of different models and then looking at consistencies across the models, okay? So here's one way of schematically looking at it. This is obviously looking at Africa. I think these were basically the idea that these were the outlines for, for some species that they're predicting the different colors of different distribution models. So one might be a bioclin, one might be an accent, one might be a boost regression tree, one might be you know, any number of, of regression or, or, or other approaches, okay? So that's the kind of, they're all predicting something different. Um, and then different ways that they were thinking of to, to actually um, look at consensus. So I think th this is basically showing you can come up with three different options. You could say this yellow here is, well, that's the core area that all the models agree on. So all the models agree that the species is, you know, the habitat is suitable for the species there. I think this um, blue line here, hopefully you can see, is saying, well, that's, that's where at least half of the models predicted that the species would be found. So there's kind of consensus or agreement across at least half the models. And then this purple outline here is more of a kind of any model predicts. So at least at least one of the models predicted that the species would occur in this in this much broader area. Um, and um, there are different um, ways of doing that. Um, uh, you know, in our effect, you know, this is with five different models, the number of models with presence, so it's, it, instead of reducing it down to three, it's actually looking across all, all five of the models um, and, and plotting a, a surface, a prediction that you know, lo lo looks like that. Or if you actually were to run loads and loads of different models, you could come up with a more suitable, uh, sorry, a, a more smooth surface that they refer to as a probability of a, a presence. Um, but, you know, there's this core area where all the models agree and then the further away that you get from that core area, the models are, you know, uh, beginning to disagree. So they're in, um, interpreting it like as a probability. That you've got a higher probability where all your models agree, and a lower probability where your models don't agree. So that's one method that you'll see in the literature that's very popular, um, that's out there for um, dealing with this issue of different models um, predict differently. So this is a, a study that's extremely well cited, and it's very, very, um, I, I'd recommend that you, you have a look at it. It's um, a, a very important paper. Uh, Jane Elith and Catherine Graham are the, are the two lead authors on it, published in Ecography in 2006. And this is their headline output that I'll talk you through in a minute. But just to give you a bit of background to it, they refer to it as the Bake Off. They did a similar thing to what I showed you with our example a couple of slides ago. Basically sat down in the room, experts, this was a few years after we did our study, or at least, um, I suppose it kind of wasn't, it was around the same time, but they, they, it, was a, it was a bigger study. They got together more people with, with, with more methods that, that they were using, and basically, I say they referred to it as a bake-off, they were saying, well, which methods? <coughs> and they ran a, a bunch of different tests, they got a whole, set, a whole suite of different data sets from around the world, I remember there were six or seven different regions, you know, there was South Africa, there was 
think maybe Mexico, there was the Swiss Alps, there was an Australian data set, I think. Anyway, there were these different data sets around Europe that they got. They did, um, one thing that was important was that they had a, 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 a presence only, for each of their case studies, they had presence only data to build the models with. So the models were only presented with presence data. And then they used presence absence data where they'd actually been out in the field and said, does it occur here or doesn't it, it occur here? To, to evaluate the performance of the models. They did it across dozens and dozens of species, huge, huge study, um, with a whole range of different methods. So things like uh, boosted regression trees, BRT, MAXEN, two different ways of building MAXEN um, models. Uh, generalized different, can't remember GDM, dif uh, difference, general difference modeling, something to remember. Um, Two different ways of, of building GARP. There's, there's uh, Open Modeler GARP. It's actually kind of the same algorithm, but implemented in, this is in an Open Modeler platform. This is in the desktop version, for those of you who have used Mars, uh, have used GARP, um, re uh, a regression splining approach, um, generalized linear models, BioClin that we've talked about. OK, so a whole bunch of different methods. This plot is showing two different evaluation statistics, okay? And we'll talk about particularly AUC tomorrow morning. AUC is basically a test of how good the model performance is. So you build the model, and then you present the model with some test data that it hasn't seen before, and you statistically evaluate how well it can predict that data. We'll look at it in detail tomorrow morning what that measure is, but all you really need to know for now is that low values are not so good and high values are better, right? Pretty predictable. And then COR is basically just a correlation, similar thing where lower values are, are saying that the correlation between the prediction and the species, whether it occurs or not, is, is lower. So, so the better models then plot up here, and remember this is kind of averaged across dozens and dozens of species in multiple different regions. <coughs> Better models plot up here, less good models plot down there. Okay? So one thing that comes out is MaxSense pretty good. BRT came out as basically the best um, method. Okay? So that's kind of the best we have at the moment for well, which method is best. General recommendation is that, well, choose a model that kind of plots up here. But what I'm going to say is it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And I would actually have some criticisms of how this um, analysis was, um, was done. And the main one is that the evaluation used the presence and absence data. Okay? So the evaluation was done by saying, how well do we, does the model predict where we found the species and how well does the model do where we've been out and found that, you know, the species doesn't actually occur there? Okay? Now think back to where we started this morning with the potato diagrams, right? That there are certain types of predictions where we're never going to find that the species is actually there. The species isn't there, but they're really useful, right? We talked about invasive species, we talked about discovering unknown species. Um, and we'll talk about that again in our applications to model. There are certain, uh, tomorrow, there are certain applications of these models where predictions um, are very useful, even though in actual fact, you know, the species isn't found there. So that's a fundamental issue. Another issue is we've, we've talked about what an absence record really is and what it means to actually find absence, right? And we talked about all the different routes that you can take to get an absence record that are kind of, you know, there's a... Basically, there's a large probability of having false absence records. Okay? So there's certainly not this even distribution that you would expect to predict presences as well as you predict absences. And I would actually put forward the argument that for a lot of the applications we have, we don't really want to be evaluating models with absence data at all. So this is very cool, this is very useful, but I'm putting a big caveat there that you're, doing, you're rewarding models that predict presences and predict absences. So the headline conclusion from this study was that funky new approaches, that wasn't the term they used, but in effect, really cool, complex approaches like MaxM, like boosted regression trees, there's a kind of more complex, less complex 
those models are better because they fit and they evaluate better when you have presence and absence data. But there is a limitation here because you're not really punishing models that overfit. So of course those models that are more complex can fit more, more complex response curves, they can do better on your presence absence data, but that doesn't mean that more simple methods like Bioclim that might do a pretty good job and a pretty transparent job of predicting presence records but don't do so well on absences are therefore shouldn't be considered. Okay? So there are nuances here. This is a really good paper. These are really, this is really important work. Um, but bear this in mind. It is simply not as straightforward as these are the best models and these are the worst models. Again, it depends what you're trying to do. What kind of predictions are you trying to make? So, um, that's the slide for now. Which model is best? There isn't a straightforward answer. What's best depends on the question that's being asked. Where did we start this morning? Are you trying to predict the distribution, species distribution modeling, or are you trying to predict the niche, ecological niche modeling? Are you predicting presences and absences? Are you predicting just presences? And of course, the data that, that are available. You know, some of these methods um, can only use presence and absences. Some can only use presences. So they're practical. You know, what kind of data have you got that will inform which method you should choose? Two things that I would emphasize: if you're going to be um, trying to publish results, if you're going to be writing this up in a thesis that needs to get through an examination committee, um, there's no right, wrong, which is the best. Um, model, but there are things that I think criteria that you must, in my opinion, meet. The first is you must justify your choice of algorithm. So you must have a reason why you have selected that algorithm. It will probably be a suite of reasons that I chose this because of, you know, Maxent is a way that um, we know how it extrapolates. Um, you can do that with any other method. We know it's only, it only requires presence data and I don't have absences. But you must think through some reasons why you have selected that algorithm. And because I could download it and it's really easy to use, often won't cut it with examiners and review boards. Um, and this is key. Explore the uncertainty from the model selection, i.e. test more than one model. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to run a big consensus approach where you run 10, 15, 20 different models and run consensus and do that kind of analysis. But I think it does mean that with some cases where it's not necessary, but in the vast majority of cases, we need to be able to say, I chose this algorithm, and here are my results. But I acknowledge that different algorithms can give different results. So I've also run all my analyses with this other algorithm that's quite different, or these two other algorithms. And yes, the results vary a little bit, but my qualitative, my overarching conclusion is not dependent on my model selection. Whatever your conclusion might be, whatever you're trying to do, um, it's important that you can answer the question, well, what if you'd chosen a different model? Okay? So while there isn't an answer which is the best model, why I can't say you should all go away and download this software or run this code and, and, and this is the way to do it, um, I think there are some basic things that you do need to do and you will always need to justify to examiners, to reviewers and ultimately bottom liners to do good science. Okay, so that would be my um, key recommendation if you like. Um, and then as usual there are a bunch of um, citations there that, that I would um, say are good you know, avenues to get into the literature.